Now we have a session devoted to the other evaluation initiatives in the information access area and it's a pleasure to have the organizers of such initiatives presenting their efforts. The first one is Ellen Voris from NIST USA and she will present the text track conference. Thank you, Nicola. Um, so this is a common slide that I use for lots of introductions to Trek, and I decided to keep it in here to, today just because of yesterday's conversation about whether or not evaluations are competitions. Um, Trek, uh, as, as my normal explanation is, it's, a, it's an extension of the Cranfield tradition. Um, so basically what we're interested in is system evaluations based on test collections. And our, our emphasis, when we really do, tr we being the organizers of TREK, really do try to keep it be an emphasis on um, advancing the state of the art through experimentation. Um, TREK's primary purpose is not benchmarking. Um, one of my sayings all the time is TREK is not a competition. I usually get laughed out of the room when I say that, but, it, but we really do try and keep the competitive aspects of TREK at a minimum. Um, one of the things that we like to see and do here is um, it's an experimental workshop, and sometimes experiments fail, right? You, you don't get the results that you expected. And sometimes that can be an extremely informative piece of information, right? That this just does not work. Um, and so the evaluation campaigns are one of the few places where you can actually record and publish, um, quote, failed experiments or, or negative results, right? And I think that's an important part of it. Um, so last year, so Trek runs on a schedule that's basically November to November. The conferences themselves are each November. Um, and so I'm going to be talking largely here about 2009 because 2010 hasn't happened yet. Um, and last year, um, as my part of my overview for it, I decided what I would do is Cranfield is now 50, right? So the original Cranfield experiments ran in the early 60s or so. So the whole idea here of, of, of the Cranfield collection, it's 50. I wanted to take a look at how, how, you know, how is Cranfield holding up at, at age 50. Um, and my claim is that the evaluation methodology started um, by Cleverton is still valuable, right? That's, it's a really carefully calibrated level of abstraction that has enough fidelity to real users' tasks to be useful, uh, but it's general enough still to be broadly applicable. And, and I think that this is a really important point um, which many people uh, don't really think about because Cranfield's been around forever, right? Um, but it's, it's a really astonishingly carefully calibrated level of abstraction. However, it is showing some signs of, of age, and largely that's because of size. Um, the size of the document collections that we're now dealing with, the size of the uh, topic sets that we would like to use, is sort of overwhelming our ability to really get evaluation measures as envisioned by Cranfield. So we would need new abstractions in order to continue to evaluate the types of tasks that we want to evaluate. Um, and yet those abstractions, again, are have to really going to be carefully calibrated because of the variability within retrieval systems. Um, not within the systems themselves, with, within the tasks that are trying to be evaluated. Um, so the evaluation difficulties here, I list three main ones. One is this variability, right? This whole idea that um, if within Cranfield, the user is this very stark represent, uh, abstraction, right, of just a set of relevance judgments. That's our only nod to users, is the relevance judgments. And yet, even there, the user effect is the biggest variable within Cranfield results, right? So different systems on the same topic have much fewer, much smaller differences than the same system on different topics. And that's an incredibly difficult thing to evaluate within, in such an environment. Um, size does matter, right? We, our pooling that we've been using um, has, a, has a dependency on, on the size of the collection. And we're, we're beyond that now, where we can handle 
um, regular pooling. Regular pooling is, is broken at this point for the size of collections that we want to evaluate. Um, there also is this, I, this problem that the model is very coarse. Uh, it was fine for doing what we can consider you know, sort of ad hoc retrieval, but even slightly different tasks, it's not a very good fit. And so for an example, example one of the tasks within TREC is a legal discovery task. Um, same basically for patent, so it's a very high recall task and where you, what you want to know is, is my system working well right now in this task on this particular query, right? Cranfield doesn't say very much at all about that uh, because um, Cranfield has evolved in such a way that we basically, because of stability issues and because of the variability issues, we report averages over sets, large sets of topics. And that doesn't really help the person who wants to know how is my system doing right now. So in Trek 2009, we, um, all the tracks use some variation of a large test collection. And in particular, we, it was the beginning of the Clue Web collection, um, which was a snapshot of the World Wide Web that was taken in early 2009. The collection was actually built by CMU um, with some support from NSF, which is the US National Science Foundation. Um, the full corpus is 25 terabytes of text, about half of, uh, half of which is in English. And we also had a, what we called a category B, which is a subset that people could run things on. Um, here's a set of people who participated in Trek 2009. Here's my standard picture of the tracks that were um, happened in each Trek. In 2009, we had a track on, on blog search, on chemical IR, so this was the mostly patent searching. The, um, an entity track, um, which you, it was similar to the, sort of the, the webs things going on in clay. Um, we also had several tracks then that were supported by this new web collection, a web track which was focused largely on diversity. Can you get different sets of, of um, can you just ambiguate what your query's meaning was when you had ambiguous queries? Um, and some, some tasks which focused on how to build better test collections in these big um, environments. In 2010, um, we're repeating most of those tracks. Um, the only track which actually stopped was the million query track, and we just sort of merged that into the web track because there wasn't any real clear reason why it should be different. Um, and that opened up a slot for a new track, and that new track is what we're calling a sessions track. The idea in the sessions track is to be able to evaluate the performance over a series of queries rather than just an individual one-shot query um, because that gets difficult evaluation questions of combinatorial explosion there. We've, for 2010, we've limited it just, our series is just two queries. Um, and we've had three types of, of pairs of queries. One is a specialization, one is a generalization, um, the other is we're calling a drifting, and this is where you sort of, you know, you started with one thing, but then you went to a slightly related query. And the idea there is, can the systems use the, the fact that the, uh, that the issuer of the queries has asked this previous query in order to, to make the results of the second query better? Um, can't say too much about 2011, um, because I can't even talk about 2010 yet, but it is the case that we're in the planning sessions for 2011 tracks. Track proposals are due to me on Monday because I can't get my mail until then. Um, and the, how to propose a Trek track is on the Trek site. Um, and it is likely, though, that we will have a track next year on searching medical records, the, the free text fields of medical records. Okay, thanks.